Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Rukmini Banerjee, and I'm one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for the year. According to the NOAA's 2021 Annual Climate Report, the combined land and ocean temperature has increased at an average rate of 0.14 degrees Fahrenheit per decade since 1880. Since 1991, the average rate of increase has been more than twice as fast with the rise of 0.32 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Climate change is real. It is a scientific fact, one that has been proven countless times with indisputable evidence. The Earth is changing, with rising sea levels, catastrophic weather events occurring along with global warming. To talk about a potential solution to our climate dilemmas, we have with us today Tom Steyer. Tom is a successful investor, business leader, and philanthropist who was fully committed to fighting the climate crisis. In 1986, Tom founded Fairlawn Capital Management, a hedge fund that pioneered, strategy, that pioneered the multi-strategy approach to investing. Under his leadership, the firm's assets grew to $40 billion and consistently delivered double-digit returns. In 2007, Tom and his wife, Kat Taylor, started Beneficial State Bank, a trip and bottom line community development bank focused on justice and sustainability by providing lending and financial services to underserved communities and their small and medium-sized businesses and nonprofits. In 2012, Tom stepped down from Fairlawn and founded NextGen Climate to focus his time and resources on climate action. NextGen Climate became NextGen America, the largest youth voter engagement organization in American history. In California, Tom led the successful effort to pass a ballot initiative that closed a corporate tax loophole generating $1.9 billion that went towards energy upgrades in schools, reducing utility costs, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Tom aided the effort to make California the largest jurisdiction in the world with a 0%, with a 100%, <laughs> that's a good mistake to correct, with a 100% clean energy law and prevented big oil's efforts to roll back California's climate protections. He has continually pushed California to make bolder climate commitments and accelerate the implementation. Today, Tom will speak about his energy advocacy and the potential of renewable energy. It will be a discussion moderated by our very own CMC professor, Thomas McHenry, and they will discuss like a lot of the amazing innovations that are occurring in the climate space and how Tom has contributed that with his own work and the work that he sees in the future. Today's program is also part of the Climate Solution Series at CMC. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Please take this time to silence and put away your cell phones. We have an amazing program for you here today. So be present, get ready to listen, to engage, and ask very good questions. As usual, video and audio recording by the audience is strictly prohibited. Per college policy, it is always recommended to wear a mask when not actively eating or drinking. Welcome to the Athenaeum. We have a full house tonight, which I think speaks to Tom's reputation, but it also speaks to your interest in climate and sustainability. So um, thank you so much for being here. We have a bunch of really good and very tough questions for Tom uh, that we assembled. He's had a peek at them earlier. Um, but we're really welcoming your questions, um, and it'll be fun. So we'll do about half an hour, 40 minutes of Q&A here, and then we'll go to your questions. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a broad question for Tom about higher education, because you are all in higher education. You're either students, faculty, administrators, um, or a visiting professor like me. And about a third of Americans graduate from a four-year college or university, so about a third of our population. Tom's had a lot of experience uh, both attending some prestigious colleges and universities, sending his children to them, and he served on the board of Stanford University, where he made an effort to have them divest, although we're going to pick up the divestment issues later. Um, and his wife served on the board of Harvard University, which is where you go if you, you don't get into CMC. <laughs> and um, I wonder, Tom, if you could start us off by talking a little bit about the promise of higher education in America and maybe where it's failing and some of your observations in that area, and in particular the role of smaller liberal arts colleges, you're at the best of them right here. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I am uh, passionate about university education, post-secondary education, um, in the United States. And it serves 
If you think about the colleges and universities in the United States and in California, they serve multiple purposes. So one of them is pedagogy, teaching young people in a variety of disciplines to prepare them for their adult life. And that is both directly relevant information for their jobs, but also information about thinking about the world so that they can be more, better rounded human beings and better citizens of the United States. That is a huge function. Second function in universities is research, is that an awful lot of the smartest people in the country work as professors doing research in everything from classics to you know, AI. And that is a function which is done with the support of the federal government, but which is critical for our society to move forward and is you know, one which I have the utmost respect for. And the third thing that I look to from colleges and universities is moral leadership. Because in general, when you're looking for somebody to tell the truth, you want somebody who doesn't have any skin in the game. They don't have a dog in the fight. They don't, you know, there's an old saying, where you stand is where you sit. Well, you find out that in the real world, people's opinions about right and wrong are overwhelmingly, not overwhelmingly, but powerfully changed by their own self-interest. And the point about colleges and universities is, if you are in fact removed enough from the demands of commerce and the private sector, then maybe you can sit there and give an honest opinion for everybody else in society. And that is a function which I've always hoped for and looked to college and university leaders to provide that honest moral voice in terms of the big questions of society. So, so let's see how we're doing. I mean, let me say this. In the state of California, in the public post-secondary institutions, I think something like 260,000 kids go to the UCs. And like 580,000 kids go to the CSUs, but 2.2 million kids go to the community colleges. So when we're thinking about education broadly in our state, sitting here at a very elite institution, just like the ones I went to, let me say that I am looking on a system level to see how we can all do better and prepare all of us for to be the best, not just productive citizens, but also concerned and value-driven Americans. That is my interest. And so when I look right here, my question is, first of all, on, a, on the substance level, is that happening here directly, which I believe it is. I think that's why this is a successful institution because of that pedagogy. And then, which I used to infuriate the people at Stanford by asking, are we doing enough to share that? Are, you know, given how big this state is and how good the pedagogy is here, is there a way using information technology, God forbid, to share the excellence that's being developed here? Because to me, having gone to a bunch of fancy schools, the only way that I justify it for myself is by trying to do things for other people in society and seeing whether I can't take all the money and all the learning and all the excellence and share it because I've been to those other schools, I've been to those community colleges, I've been to those CSUs, and those kids are tremendous. They work their ass off, they really care. They're very sincere just like you guys. And so the more that, the better we are, the more we should share, in my opinion. And, th and that's, I think, the standard. I believe in excellence, and I believe in sharing. Great, that's a great answer, Tom, and, and really thoughtful. We're gonna spend most of our time talking about climate and the environment, but, and this may be a very short answer, Tom, but my <laughs> understanding that your interest in the environment was inspired by a teaching assistant in your undergraduate environmental studies class? So you should know that I have a checkered past. And it hasn't always, I haven't actually always gone the right way. So actually, Professor McHenry was my teaching assistant. <laughs> Enough of that. And we'll move fact, to the next question. He had <laughs> virtually the entire soccer team, of which I was a member, and the whole football team in his class, which bespeaks to his scholarship. It, it made it much easier for Tom to get a good grade in the class. 
Um, so I want to want to talk about your transition from Wall Street, although you were in San Francisco, but you were basically running a, a hedge fund, to uh, working full time on climate. What pushed you to make that transition? Why did you choose to give up a successful career in finance to focus on climate? And why, as part of that decision, did you end up focusing more on politics than on, say, science and law, which have been the traditional levers uh, on, on environmental policy? So let, let me just start with why climate, and then let me say why I left my job. Um, you know, as I was saying to some people earlier, I worked for a summer when I was 24 in Alaska advising the Alaska state government on what to do with the extra billions of dollars that were flowing off the North Slope in the form of tax revenues on oil and gas. They had so much money they didn't know what to do with it and so they hired a 24 year old to tell them which you gotta wonder about, but they did. And I loved Alaska. I loved it. I went into the woods every weekend. I had so much fun. It was the greatest. So in 2006, with four kids and a wife, I was like, you guys have got to see how great this is. So let's go up there in the summer, and I'll take you to all these places in the woods, and let's see what North America looked like before 1492. Let's see how f incredibly rich the wildlife is, how amazing it is. So we get up there. And it's just melting. It was so obvious. I mean, you could read a million books, but if you actually go there and see a state melting, the places you'd seen, it was just mind blowing. And we all decided, oh my gosh, you know, this is a huge deal. And I thought, I mean, Tommy was asking me why politics. First, I thought it was technology, and I supported a bunch of technological efforts at universities. Then I thought it was information, like people just don't know because they didn't go to Alaska, so I'm gonna collect a bunch of credible people who are Republicans, Democrats, and independents, business people, and tell everybody, wow, dude, it's happening, and try and do it in a way that was absolutely apolitical. And then I realized, no, everybody knows this. You're an idiot, Tom. This is something where we have to push people to change politically. And, and let me talk for one second about how uh, one little thing about politics that I'm sure you know, but just in case you don't, I'll mention it. You think that if 90% of Americans are for something, that that will happen. Like, that's what I thought, to be honest. 90% of us want, you know, background checks on guns, say. It'll happen because we all want it, and if they don't do it, they're not gonna get elected. That's how people think, that's how I thought. That is not true, just to be clear. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters how you vote. So if you really want background checks on guns, but it's your 10th issue, so you're definitely not changing your vote based on that, it doesn't matter what you think, because if the 10% is gonna vote on it, they're gonna win. The only thing that matters is your vote. And so even though I'm looking at this thinking, I just need to let people know, what really needed to happen is I, people had to care. There's a, people had to say, if you won't do this, I will not vote for you. You have to know that. And that is actually what drives American politics. And that's why I turned to politics, because people knew it. Republicans wanted it. Republican voters knew this. They're not crazy. They're smart. They could see it. They don't want their kids to die. But it wasn't in their top five issues. And so, as a result, Republican electeds could do something that their own people didn't want and get away with it for as long as they wanted. It's really about what you care about. So the question was, how do you get people involved to a level where they'll demand it? Because that's what American politicians respond to. Tom, you used to say that climate was the fourth issue on everybody's top three list. <laughs> you know, my next question that's going to follow up is about where we are on climate, but has that changed? Is climate now in the top three? Oh, for sure. Well, first of all, it's a big country, and people think about a lot of things and think about things differently. I would say for people under 35, it's definitely in the top three. You know, we've polled young people for... 10 years, you know, compulsively, 
And I think that there's a huge generational divide here, Tom. I think that there's a very large geographic divide here. You know, different parts of the country see this in very different ways. But I also believe that this will be, you know, I believe this will be the defining issue for this country in the medium term and that we will deal with it very successfully and as a, as a country together, a united country. Great, thank you. Um, I want to talk about climate and where we are. First, I want to get a show of hands in the room for all the students who are involved with the Roberts Environmental Center, the REC. Raise your hand, nice and high there. Oh, they're all hanging out together. So <laughs> you might want to hang out with them. So the Roberts Environmental Center is one of, John, help me out, 12, 13, 14 institutes at CMC, for anybody who's not intimately involved, and has a detailed program for students to be involved in doing programs and consulting in the environmental area. So if you have that interest, please talk to the students who are over at that table in that corner. Um, so Tom, tell us where we are on climate now. Give the students and, and the uh, audience a sense of that. Um, are we doing well? Are we failing? Where are we falling short? W what's the overall climate picture? So first I'll give you that hu how we're doing as humans. But obviously the report card comes from Mother Nature, right? I mean, the real question here is what's happening in the natural world. And as I like to say, Mother Nature does not give extensions and Mother Nature does not grade on the curve. I mean, it's physics. So there's a right and wrong answer in this course. If you look at where we've come, I would say we have had an amazing decade in terms of moving forward. I think if you look at the policies of the United States, we've come a really long way. 2022 is a very big year for climate policies on a federal level. If you look at the attitudes of business, I mean, I like to point out GM, which sued California in 2019 because they said our miles per gallon rules were too tough, and now we're gonna be 100% EVs by 2035. That is a 180 in terms of attitude by, and it's typical of America. American business has made a huge change. The money going into solutions, which is what I spend all my time on, is up many fold. It, we're still not there. People think it'll cost $4 trillion a year to rebuild this world in a healthy way. We're spending about a, a trillion. So we're not on path to, do, you know, but that's up a ton. If you look at consumer attitudes, and you can be as cynical as you want to be about consumer attitudes, and I'm very cynical, but probably 20% of the United States will buy things differently based on wh what they think about the impact on the natural world. Um, I just think on a human level, this society has come a lot, we have a lot longer, to wait, a lot further to go. That's all good. If you look at the natural world, I mean, obviously, it's hard to miss living in California. I mean, the natural world is struggling at 1.2, 1 point, uh, basically 1.2 C. And we're, people expect, scientists say that there's a 50% chance that we will go through 1.5 C in the next five years. So when you think about where we are relative to the UN 1.5 C, I, I, very few people think we will not go through that. And I think that you know the issue for us is gonna be at what point do we make this the, you better do this right now and we better all chip in to make this happen? Because it's, if you look, I, I, I don't know if, it, some of you I know have done this, but if you go back to, 20, to 2000 and look at the projections from the UN, you know, the UN gives projections of where CO2 is gonna be, where temperature is gonna be, you know, kind of where the state of climate and they give you a range, and it's a political organization. So if you go back to 2000, if you look at where we're gonna be in 2020, we were at the worst end of the range, but we were in the range. So it was like, okay, if this is bad, we're right there at the edge, but that, they were not bad at predicting. What they absolutely missed, they thought we could survive six to seven C in 2000, and we are struggling at 1.2 C. So it's like, 
our, the, the impact on, the, on life on Earth of changes in air temperature is so much greater than anybody understood 20 years ago. It's infinitely different. I mean, right now, if, if you said to somebody, we're looking at 6 to 7C, you'd be like, okay, game over. And at that point, they were feeling like, when we reach there, that's when we're going to have a problem. So when we think about how we're doing, by 2000, you know, they upped the ante on us between 2000 and now. And so the real question is going to be, how fast can we move out the technologies and rebuild this world in a sustainable way, which I believe we will do, but I believe we will, you know, our chance to avoid this is over. We're in this, and it's just a question of how we deal with it, how well we deal with it, how humanely we deal with it, how successfully we deal with it. So a lot of people in this audience are interested in investment careers, and they're also interested in climate. Tell us a little bit about climate investing, what you're doing now, and the kinds of technologies and the kind of technological development we're going to need to see to address climate. So let me say this. In 1996, so that's, I guess, before a lot of you were born, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a venture capitalist, and that was right when there started to be public companies related to the internet. And they were like eBay and AOL, you know, ones which were the very early companies. And I said this to my friend Roger, I said, you know, what do you think about these internet companies? And he said, Tom, let me ask you a question. When you go into work in the morning, do you turn on the lights? And I said, yeah. And he said, does that make you an electricity company? And I said, no. And he said, well, let me tell you something. The internet is a tool for delivering information, goods, and services. There's no internet company. They're just companies that use the internet, a new tool for serving their customers. That's what I'd say to you about climate. Like everybody thinks, and we do do this, that this is about inventing a new windmill, a new way of making cement, an electric car, sequestering carbon, glass that lets, you know, basically takes away the need for heating and ventilating, heat pumps, you know, all the gadgets you can think of. They think that's what it is. And that is part of it. It's going to be everything. Every company is going to have to be taking climate into consideration in every part of what they do. It's just going to be the world. Because if we don't do that, we're definitely not going to win. So if you're working for a bank, you may not think you're working in a climate company. I mean, you're making loans, you're taking deposits, all the things that banks do. But you know something? You're definitely a climate company. You know, the Ameri four, big four American banks are the biggest fossil fuel lenders in the world. You know, we do 50% of the Russian oil and gas to support Vladimir Putin. So if you, it's going to be in everybody. If you're a landlord, OK, you own big commercial buildings, What's your carbon footprint? You know, the hu huge part of this is the built environment. You can't just be a landlord. You are going to have to take into consideration and be proactive in thinking about it. And that's the truth, Tom. So when I think about this, of course I think about the tech. And of course I think about deploying the tech specifically where, for the generation and use of electricity. But agriculture is a huge part of this. You can't be a farmer anymore and do it just the way great granddaddy did. Like, that's out. We're going to have to be taking into consideration both the carbon emissions related to agriculture and the carbon sequestration that's possible through agriculture. And that's just going to be the real world we live in until we get this under control. Great. Thank you. We're going to come back to career advice a little bit later, <coughs> Tom, in the questions. But I want to talk to you, uh, have you talk a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, uh, the IRA, and what the promise of the IRA is in, in the United States the next, say, five years. So I'll make two basic points about this. And the basic one is this. It's a ton of money. It is a huge amount of money basically to subsidize the technologies and get them so that they're at cost parity with anything else in the world. And it's everybody knows it's stuff like, you know, EV charging stations and windmills 
and solar arrays, the gadgets. It is also at least as much of it is basically development money, cheap development money for new technologies that have to be built. So it's about both the deployment of existing technologies at scale, fast, so that in fact we can get them out there and drive down this, the cost curve, but it's also about building the new technologies so that then five years from now we can deploy them at scale. So if you think about technology, it's always kind of a wave. Like this wave we've got to push through and deploy because we are going to have a whole bunch of other stuff in five years to push through and deploy. And you know, and there's some things out there which are not for sure going to happen, but amazing game changers. And we'll see. You know, there are 12 companies in the United States going for nuclear fusion. <laughs> nuclear fusion, if you can do it at scale for a competitive price, is a game changer. And there's a lot of stuff out here where we can say American technology, American entrepreneurship, American know-how can make a difference here and it can make a difference around the whole world. I'm going to come back in a second and ask you about some of the challenges the Democratic Party is facing. But before we do, I want to go to Europe and then to the globe. European Union, I've heard you say a number of times, is way ahead of the United States on climate. Is that, is that true? What do you mean by that and why? <clears throat> well, I, let me say, as a completely parochial American, yes and no, they are definitely ahead in terms of regulation. So if you look at regulations about charging for carbon, about border adjustments, Europe has been willing, you know, if you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, it's really a big carrot, right? It's really saying we're going to subsidize the clean industries so that they can get to market parity with everybody else. And we're going to spend the money and make that happen in big size, and we're going to build those industries. The flip side of that, you could say, and the Europeans have said, no. We're going to charge the polluters. Like, as opposed to subsidizing the non-polluters, we're going to charge the polluters and make them pay a lot. And we're going to make that happen. And not only are we going to do it within our country, which is a, you know, recognized thing. We charge Americans. The EPA charges people. But they're also going to do border adjustments. So they're saying, we're not even going to let you send your pollution caused goods into our country without charging you, which means you're going to have to, if you think about that, that sounds nice, but somehow I have to know, you know, okay, how was this jacket made and how much pollution is associated with it if you're going to actually charge me something for the jacket? And that's a huge information question because you can't just say all the jackets that were made in, you know, choose your country, the United States were made the same way with the same electricity source and you know in the same process. It's not true. So you have to actually be tracking it pretty carefully and you're going to do that. So we're going to see a huge amount of information that has to be granular and accurate and very widespread for this to happen. Yeah, it's very exciting and interesting to see and um, let's go to the globe, Tom. Um, California is about 1% of Global emissions, the U.S., you told our climate solutions class this afternoon, down around 11 percent of global emissions now. Um, China's up in the mid-30s, maybe. Uh, the G20 countries account for about 80 percent of global emissions. What do you see as the solutions at the global level and the impediments? And how do you feel about the leadership of the countries that are the big emitters? And we're being taped. So obviously this has been traditionally a very concentrated source of emissions. I mean, it's not even the G20, it's many fewer countries than that in terms of people who have been traditionally and are currently big emitters. And to be fair to the United States of America, we're the biggest historical emitter and we still remain the biggest emitter per capita. So we are gonna, I believe, I believe we will cut this in half or damn close to it by 2030 but in terms of the historical emissions, we've led the way in terms of 
basically producing cheap, dirty energy for 200 years to power our economic and industrial growth. That's where we are now, but that doesn't mean that that's where we're going to be. When we look forward, you know, the United States, Europe, we're, we're not a tiny fraction, but what are we together? Something like 12% of the world's population. And so the real question is going to be both how do we do in reducing, but also for all the people who have never emitted, but who would like to have electricity, and who are in the billions and billions of people, exactly what kind of electricity they're going to they generate, and what kind of society are they going to build. And if you think about it in a good way, the hopeful thing is this. You know, we built the telephone system with copper wire, which, I, again, I, some of you may be too young to remember when you had an actual phone that plugged into the wall and which you couldn't carry around with you. But that's all there was. So they basically built out copper wire all over the United States of America, and people would, and they wouldn't pick up their cell phone. They'd stop and go to a pay phone that didn't move. You moved, the phone didn't move. Now the phone moves along with you. In Africa, they never built copper wire. They're never going to build copper wire. They got cell phones. They skipped that whole thing. And the hope for the world is that, in effect, electricity will follow the pattern of the cell phone. That we'll never build out all the fossil fuel coal infrastructure in the developing world. And I, I was saying to some of the people today, the numbers are gigantic. You know, we're whatever it is, 320, 330 million people. India's 1.4 billion people. Most of those people do not have electricity. They will have five times as much electricity in 2050 as now. How that gets built out will affect them. It will affect us. You know, throughout the developing world, there are huge countries with hundreds of millions of people where way less than 20% of the people can turn on the lights. And so they fully expect they're going to have electricity over the next 30 years. And how that gets built out, it's not just us reducing. It's how we build out the rest of the world. That's going to be critical. And how we do it together, and whether our technology enables them to do cheaper and cleaner so that it's a good deal for them is going to turn to our our ability to develop cheap, good technology for them, like the cell phone, is going to be critical to how this whole play turns out. Um, we'll probably get some questions from the audience about some of the global issues, but I want to return to your party of choice, the Democratic Party. <laughs> this is an audience of people that know a lot about politics, and I think it's a place where people talk about politics, which is great. And I've heard you express your frustration about some of the messaging from the Democratic Party. And I'm interested, I, I'm, I'm sure this audience is interested in your thoughts about that, if you're willing to share them. You'll get an expurgated version. Um, for one thing you should know, I mean, I am an unapologetic Democrat. But both of my parents at one point were unapologetic Republicans. So I like to think I have a reasonably open mind towards people of both parties. And I was saying to the people at my table, going around this country, I am a huge lover of Americans, and it doesn't matter what party you're in. I would say when I look at the system the way it's going now, I mean, I'm a Democrat. I believe we're right on just about every issue. And if you poll Americans, regardless of party, they think that Democrats have a better message on almost every issue. Just so you know, if you polled it, we'd win on every issue. I believe Democrats say some of the most negative things about America I can imagine. They say negative things about Americans. They suggest, I believe Americans are fantastic, but I think that in, in large part, the Democratic Party tends to take a very doer view of the country, our future, and our behavior. And I think people, it's very dispiriting. And I, I look at the Republicans and I disagree with them on almost everything, but they're always really cheerful and they think everything's great. And that's actually, people like it. So I could go a lot more, there's a lot of nuance about why people are Republicans or Democrats. It's got a lot to do with identity and history and a, a bunch of other things. But the truth is, 
I think we, my belief is we have a huge task ahead of us. We're definitely up to it. We should be giving ourselves reassurance that we are together, regardless of whether we agree on everything, and we obviously don't. But I, I believe that's how we will succeed, and I believe that the Democrats should be much, much more positive about the history of the United States, the people of the United States, and the future of the United States. That was slightly expurgated, but it's also really fascinating, Tom, and you know, we have some questions on that. We're going to go to questions in about five minutes, but um, I have a couple more that I'm dying to ask you, uh, and this is one that also might be of interest to your audience. You decided to run for president in 2020, and I got to hear you at the Democratic Convention in New Hampshire, where all the candidates show up, and I believe you told me that the story about whether someone was asked in 2016 if they would vote for Hillary Clinton, and the answer in New Hampshire was, well, I've only had dinner with her twice, I haven't decided. <laughs> it's very much uh, retail politics there. But what made you want to run for president, and what was it like? Well, first of all, the reason I wanted to run is I watched those early debates and I was having a heart attack. Because they kept asking, the, the question was, do you believe in single-payer health care? And that was the thing that was the question of the day that caused people to be embarrassed or triumphant or whatever. Let me tell you something, that is an irrelevant question. We are not going to have single-payer health care. So that was just like, th that was the dumbest thing I could imagine us talking about because there is no chance that we're gonna take our healthcare system, regardless of whether we should or not, and go back to sing and go to single payer. We made that decision in 1948. We can change things on the margins. My God, that, that was incredible. I thought that was the biggest waste of time. And no one was talking about climate. No one was talking about race, which I believe is at the heart of American politics and something we really should address directly. And no one was talking about age about the fact that, you know, I look at this room, you know, very few of you guys are in your 80s. So, honestly, I felt like no one was telling the truth and everyone was trying to duck, bob, and weave, and someone had to go in and be a pain in the neck, which I'm quite good at, it turns out. I honestly thought I could bring up some issues, specifically climate, and try and push the party and the country to deal with the issues that I thought were in our face to actually you know, live out our destiny of who we think we are as a country and a people. And I thought, okay, I'm perfectly happy to do that. And having you know, set out to do it, I thought the most fun, other than sitting around the dinner table bullshitting with my family, the second most fun I've had is sitting around bullshitting with Americans broadly. Super fun, people say it's a hard job and I would say, you know, they always like, campaigning, it's so hard. I was like, have you ever had a job? That is hard. This, no. I've known you for a long time, and I saw you on that campaign trail, and I saw how much you enjoyed it, and I saw other candidates, and I thought, they seem sort of pained by this, but you'd love nothing more than hanging out with hog farmers in Iowa or wherever it was and just talking to people, and it was, um, it was fantastic. So maybe there's... So can I tell you one thing? So I did hang out with hog farmers. But, so I go to this farm, and I, look, we have a farm. I worked as a cowboy. I kind of think I know enough, even though I'm from the middle of Manhattan, to be dangerous. But this guy's running a huge Iowa industrial farm. So he's basically doing corn, soy, and hogs. Very few people on it, very, all run by computer, really big, fancy tractors. So I'm interested in all this. I really am, I'm not bullshitting. And you know, how do you do the pricing? How do you do the ins crop insurance? Blah, 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 blah. Really nice guy. Learn a ton. So we're leaving. So he takes care of me. We have an event at his farm. His wife is nice as pie. I have a great time. I enjoy all the people. We're leaving. He goes, by the way, I have cancer. I go, really? You have cancer? He goes, yeah, everybody here has cancer because the chemicals we do for fertilizer and the chemicals we do for pesticides run into the water, we all have cancer. And he died like two years later and he was 62. Now that is a learning experience. You know, those guys all knew it. I mean, he, and he, he was doing that, he was, he was taking that risk knowingly, running that farm with his family, family farm for generations. 
It's like, what? I just thought, my God, is there anything more interesting than learning these things? How do you learn that sitting in San Fran or even running the regenerative agricultural operation we run? Got to get out there and meet the people. Another lead in, a, a lead in question on that would be wealth inequality in America. Everybody in the room knows the statistics. Um, I can't remember, but I, I think, you know, the, what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have net assets that are greater than half the Americans. Um, lots of statistics out there. What do we do about wealth inequality? Well, first of all, most Americans don't have any wealth. I mean, I think the number of people who, you know, when you compare it, I think there's a huge proportion of Americans who have little to no savings. And I don't know if it's 30% or 20%, but there's a mil tens of millions of Americans have basically no safety net. And obviously there's a bunch, so one of the things that's, you know, I was for <laughs> a wealth tax when I was running for president, it's something that people didn't think was such a great idea, but which I thought was a great idea because there are some actual reasons that are not nefarious, that don't have to do with cruelty or extreme greed, why now people can be so much richer relatively. And it, I'll, it, to just to say really quickly, why does California, why are all these companies worth so damn much money? Basically because software is infinitely replicable and doesn't cost anything after you've built it. So if, you, if you're gonna write a software program and you charge someone $100, maybe it costs you $1,000 to develop that cost software program, but you can sell it to 8 billion people. And it doesn't cost, and the cost of goods sold is basically nothing, and the margin is in the 90s. And as a result, you know, in the old days, Henry Ford had to build the goddamn car. Like, there's a physical thing. It's limited by actual physical stuff. I mean, think of all the big companies here. They don't have any actual physical stuff. It's stuff that's on the web. It's stuff that's on a computer. So there's reasons why these people are so crazy rich. Having said that, you know, you look at Amazon, zero taxes. Come on. You know, the, the tax structure really got manipulated on behalf of rich people. And regardless of, forget motive, it's not good for the United States that we have this inequality, and it's not good that those people have that much control, and it's not good that other people are so disadvantaged. So from my standpoint, I was for a wealth tax because I, I honestly don't understand why anyone needs or deserves that much money. I can understand people wanting to have a nice house. I can understand people wanting to drive a nice car or take a vacation or pay for health care. But at some point, it's... I don't understand it, and I don't think it's good for our country. If we're a de democratic society, we can't have some, you know, small group of people who are controlling our destiny. I just don't think it's right. Great. I just got the nod, so we'll be, we will be can ask people to start to assemble by the microphones. But I have two last questions for Tom. The first is, what's the one thing that you know today <laughs> that you wish you knew when you got started working on climate issues? Immediacy of the problem? No. So here's what I'd say. Look, <laughs> I spent the whole time working on climate asking myself what my mother would like me to do. So my, Tommy knows my mother, and she was a very funny, brash person who I, of course, adored because everyone loves their mother. But the whole time I was wondering, am I being too rude about this, or am I not being rude enough? Like, this is a problem, and I'm still trying to be polite about it. I don't really, I mean, I was saying I'm so brash. I was trying to be polite to people because I didn't want to call them out and be really nasty. But at the same time, I was trying to be as honest as I could so that we could actually confront the reality of the problem. If I were going to do it again, I'd be a million times meaner. Honestly, I, I, I was really trying way too hard in retrospect to get along with everybody and I think it was a mistake because I think we really needed to push harder and I needed to be more confrontational in my ex experience and it's not really my personality honestly. I think of myself as somebody who's trying to get along but in retrospect we should have pushed harder. You, you always like to say that 
politics is a contact sport. That stayed with me. Full well, contact sport. The last question before we go to the audience, Tom, relates to careers. And you've hired students. Uh, one of the people that works with you on climate is a recent Scripps graduate. And I know one bit of advice you would give to all the students in the room is, of course, to take my climate solutions class. That's number one through 10. And Professor Bronwyn Williams' uh, climate science class, which is taught at CMC 11 through in the 20. fall. Yeah, that's a better class. Um, but where do you, where do you see as the uh, career opportunities in climate? And what might you advise someone who's a freshman at the Claremont Colleges about the kinds of classes and the kinds of internships and work they should do to learn about climate and most productively participate? Well, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I do go back to that story I was telling you about internet companies. And that's this. I think people should do the things that they really enjoy and think they're good at. But I think every job is going to be a climate job. So if you're going to go work in a bank, which obviously we started a bank based on economic justice and environmental sustainability. If you're going to be a banker, you should be pushing for the good. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try and be the best banker. Of course you should. But you should be holding yourself to account on that. And if you're going to, I, I feel that's true in every job. If you're going to do it, do it with integrity and include your, live your values through you. I don't think you can separate what you do in your professional life from who you are as a person. And you know, there was that whole thing in America, and, and I use as an example Andrew Carnegie, who ran the biggest steel company, ran U, built U.S. Steel. And was, I think he was the richest man in America. And he basically was a complete SOB. And he treated people like dirt, and he employed really young kids, and he paid them nothing, and he worked them to the bone. And then he turned around and gave all his money away to libraries. Put a library in every town in the United States of America. I don't think that works. I don't think it works. I think if you're gonna, you really have to, you are, your, your behavior defines you. And so you should hold yourself to account, including when you think, okay, doing the right thing is gonna be expensive here. I think you have to do that, and I, don't, I think you will find that doing the right thing is going to pay off in multiple ways. So honestly, Tommy, I, I think you should do the thing you love. If you want to be a screenwriter, be a screenwriter. If you want to be a firefighter, be a firefighter. But do it with an awareness that your integrity depends on your living up to your values when it's difficult. That's great advice, and I think um very well put. Uh, let's go to the audience for questions. We'll ask you to make them questions and make them relatively short because I expect we'll have a lot of them. Uh, my name is George. Uh, I'm a PPE and public policy student, uh, sophomore at CMC. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, you talked a lot about um, all these new technologies, the IRA pushing out all this money to, to fund both scaling and developing. Um, and one thing that, that was sort of in the conversation around the IRA but didn't end up getting, including, uh, getting included was permitting reform. Um, and there was sort of this big debate over you know, whether the trade-off to allow more fossil fuel projects but also more clean energy projects would lead to more or less carbon emissions. Um, and there seems to be sort of generally like a, this kind of stumbling block sometimes with environmental groups lining up against things like that that would are really sort of essential for scaling technologies. Um, and so I'm sort of wondering what you think um, can be done in the environmental movement to overcome that. Uh, yeah. So uh, George de described it pretty well. It, it wasn't part of the IRA, but it was in a kind of an accompanying legislation that was specifically pushed by Senator Manchin. It did include faster permitting for and more permitting for oil and gas projects, but it basically enabled much faster permitting for, you know, wind and solar too. So let me just put a little bit of a little parameter around how this looks, which is, you know, right now in California to do offshore wind is six years. I remember very well in like 2015 walking through an old army base in California with the congresswoman there, and I said, well, what are you guys gonna do with this base? 
She said, well, we've been working on it for eight years and we're starting to get some traction. Well, if you think you have 10 years to get this right, losing six years for an offshore wind project or eight years to start to get some traction doesn't really work. So we're gonna have, it's a huge issue. And you know, look, I, I don't think there's any way that we don't need significant permitting reform. And it's especially true in the state of California. I think we're the worst, just to be clear. And, and I think that we're gonna have to be smart about it, but we just can't afford, we're gonna have to telescope the time here and do the work so that we don't make stupid mistakes, so that we do take things into consideration. But a huge part of this, I mean, I know you guys all know this phrase, nimbyism. There's a ton of nimbyism in this world, and we're just gonna have to roll over that. Thanks so much. Hi, um, my name is Simran. I'm a junior studying economics and data science. And um, my question relates to the beginning of the talk when you're talking about like um, c trying to bring the pedagogy from like more elite institutions to other ones like co community colleges and CSUs. And um, I'm wondering like if like pedag changing the pedagogy is like great, but the graduation rates at a lot of these colleges, like especially non-private ones, are abysmal. Like the four-year graduation rate is only 41%, and then at the six-year graduation rate is 63%, which is pretty bad for what's supposed to only be four years. So do you think there are ways that we can focus on like improving graduation rates at some of these schools with pretty low ones instead of the pedagogy? Because if the students aren't at the school, then there's no point of yeah. having pedagogy. So I'm, I'm no expert, so I want to back down a little from sounding like such a know-it-all. I don't want to sound like a know-it-all, but I will say this. What I really was talking about was the ability to use distance learning in IT. And I think there are people doing that really well. One of them is Arizona State University, which is using a lot of that to, to actually have, I think, hundreds of thousands of undergrads. So when I look at those low graduation rates, the question you have to ask is, okay, why? You know, why do, only 41% graduate in four years and 63% in six years. I don't know, but I will say this. I know that of the kids who go to community college, which is only a two-year program, 70% of them have full-time jobs. And so a lot of this in my mind, the thing I love about IT is you can study at midnight. The professor doesn't have to be there. You know, you can fit it into your schedule. So a lot of this in my mind is going to be how do we get the best teaching to as many people as possible at the time when they can do it, given their economic situation and their family situation? Because lots of people feel like tons of responsibility, maybe to the older people in their family, and maybe they have kids. So I think people get squeezed a lot. That's all I can say. I know that people aren't perfect, but I really do believe that you know, I'm from a family that believes education is the way for everybody to move forward. And so the cheaper, easier, more available it is, I'm for. And the best. And, you know, the, the quality of education here is really high, so making it available is really valuable. Thank you. Hi. Uh, let me first just say thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Josh Morgenstein. I'm studying international relations here at CMC. Um, one of the things you said that really resonated with me was it's not just how we reduce emissions at home, it's also how we sort of build clean energy in other parts of the world. One of the things that I'm really concerned about is I see a lot of countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, turning towards Chinese loans to sponsor energy projects. And while China obviously invests a lot in renewable energy and green energy, a lot of the projects they're sponsoring abroad are, are coal-fired plants and are contributing a lot to pollution. And so my question is how the United States government as well as United States companies can sort of align the incentives for developing countries to start building cleaner energy so they can prosper but also keep their emissions low. So of course this is a huge question for the globe. And it is true that China was, had a huge program which was to lend money to developing nations, particularly for electricity, particularly through coal. Now, I think that they have pulled that back a fair bit, but there is the real, there's a gigantic issue for America in this. So let's assume that we have a, technolo a clean technology that provides electricity cheaper. 
building that plant, I don't know how many of you guys, I'm gonna assume not that high a percentage, have invested tons of money overseas, but I have. And so when you think about the risks of going to Sub-Saharan Africa and building a $5 billion plant, you know, you normally think the question is, does the plant work? Do I have any customers? Do they pay me? But let's say that, in fact, you are in Ethiopia. And so Ethiopia was supposed to be the best place to invest in Africa three or four years ago. And they had a horrible civil war, which isn't really over. It's, I think, in better shape. I mean, I'm sure Josh would know better than I would. <laughs> but it basically, in, in terms of as an investment, was, would be a disaster for every investment in that country. And their countries, it, it's a very, those are very complicated places to invest. Every place is complicated, but the swings there are much bigger. So when you think about American companies like, we may have the best technology, but who's gonna go in and put in $5 billion into that plan? And is it gonna be the American government? And there's a lot of talks about so-called blended finance, which is government and NG nonprofits and corporations. But I can tell you the reason that 90% of the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo don't have electricity is for the reason I'm telling you. And so how this works is gonna be partially technology, Josh, but a lot of this is gonna be about can I make a safe investment here? How do we create a safe investment here? And that I think the government's gonna to have to figure out. And they are not that far along on it, in my opinion. And you've obviously seen the World Bank having huge problems stumbling over this. Oh. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Hi, I just wanted to thank you for your talk. My name is Brenna Bell. I am a sophomore at CMC studying the EEP major, which is Environment, Economics, and Politics with a sequence in data science. And kind of referencing education, not necessarily in terms of college education, but regarding educating the public about climate science. I had this interview when I was doing interviews for um, summer internships, and it's an interesting question that I want to extend to you because the question was, of course we want to educate everyone and make them care about climate science, but if you had to pick one, which do you think is more important right now? Trying to make the elder generations care or focus on educating the future generations? So, I happen to have a very good friend who is organizing people over the age of 65 about climate. <laughs> but what I would say is it's a lot easier and more impactful mm -hmm. with more people to go to young people. And so I think that, you know, the reason I started Next Gen was because I felt the largest generation in American history, the most diverse generation in American history, the most progressive generation in American history voted at half the rate of other Americans. Mm -hmm. If young people vote, it changes everything. But let me say one other thing. So I'm definitely on the young side, mm -hmm. just so you know. But the other thing I'd say is this. I think that the communications around climate have been terrible. Yeah. And I think that you know we've basically been selling gloom and doom on a global basis and telling people we're totally screwed and there's nothing you can do about it. No one likes hearing that. Yeah. I don't like hearing that. I think that you know that is a in terms of communications the question we have to ask is how do we get people to think yeah it is a real issue and we can solve it and solving it is going to be awesome mm -hmm. because it is a real issue it's not trivial we can solve it and if we do this right it actually is going to be awesome mm -hmm. but you know i think I look at the pandemic, I look at the United States of America, I look at the mental health issues, however you wanna measure those mental health issues. We have a huge mental health problem in this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think <laughs> positive mental attitude gets a lot more done than anything else in this world. And I think we have to figure, we can do this, we're gonna do this, and it's going to be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk, Mr. Steyer. My name's Henry Long. I'm a sophomore at CMC studying philosophy, politics, and economics. 
Uh, you mentioned some of the issues faced by European countries when trying to regulate uh, and determine uh, the kinds of products they let into their countries based on emissions. I think more broadly this reflects uh, an issue faced with regulators everywhere is trying to quantify um, the impacts, um, external both benefits and costs um, exacted by uh, new climate technologies, but also um, coal uh, and existing fossil fuel plants. Uh, do you have any ideas for how we can move forward and solve that um, quantification problem for regulators? So I know people will think that I paid you to ask me that question, Henry. Um, yeah, actually. Look, I think people think that we're going to solve this problem of climate with gadgets. And gadgets are going to be part of the solution, all the things you think of in terms of cars and electricity generation and the things you stick in your garage to regulate when you use electricity and when you store electricity. And th that's all true. But there's this assumption that somehow we're going to come up with a thousand technologies and it's just going to work. And that is not true. That is not true. What is true is we're going to have to a answer the question that Henry asked, which is, how are we going to actually have the information so we can actually change what we do in a way that matters? And that is going to be a question of a lot of data and a lot of software. And you want to know something? We're in California. You know what we produce? Data and software. Because if you think, you know, there's this old saying, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you cannot measure it, how are you going to change? If you don't know what the problem is, how do you solve the problem? So are we going to have to have systems in every, and look, if you look at the factories, let's talk about for one second about factories because we're talking about imports. You make the stuff, right? There are two million factories in the world. Most of them are in Asia. A hell of a lot of them are in China, but there are a lot all over Asia. That's really where over half the, the factories are. Are we going to wait until Indonesia both passes and enforces a good climate law in terms of the manufacture of shirts. It's going to be hard. But can we, in fact, that factory is part of an international web of companies producing the shirts you guys buy. So if that's true, then we're going to have to ask them for the information. It's going to have to be accurate. And we're then going to have to put it into a bigger data system so that the people who are buying the shirts know what's going on, so that, in fact, they can push them to change the way they make shirts if they're making them in a destructive fashion. And that is happening. And we can do that. And it's actually in the interest of the people. Let's say all of us were running a factory in Jakarta. And basically, it's pretty tough. And what we want to do is make payroll on Friday. That's what we want. We want to make payroll. So we, we're, we're manufacturing shirts so we can pay the bills on Friday and pay all our workers. Our cust if our customers tell us, you have to do this or we will fire you. We're going to do it. That's the motive. And that's, that's the motive that will work in this case. So when you ask, they're going to have to give you the information. You're going to have to audit the information to see that they're telling the truth. You're going to have to put it into a, a, a program. And then you're going to have to watch the change and insist on it. And that's going to work if we make it happen. Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, my name is Thomas. I'm a first year and I'm studying international political economy. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my question is quite short. Um, in the rise of political polarization in this nation, um, how do you suggest that we students can initiate change and initiate not even uh, climate deniers, but individuals who don't prioritize climate at the top of their list? How are we going to initiate them and um, allow them and to make them want to vote for climate on the ballot? Well, it's, I mean, to me, if you start with political partisanship and separation, you know, the thing that I believe people really hate is being vilified and dismissed and looked down on. And you can see it from both parties, obviously. I, I was at a, I mean, I see it and I find it's, People are very dismissive and rude about each other across parties. And I think the first thing is to recognize that it, 
people who absolutely disagree with you on every single count can be very good, conscientious Americans trying to do the right thing. You just think they're dead wrong. And they think you're dead wrong, but it doesn't mean you're not a good American. It doesn't mean they're not a good American. And so to me, the question here is gonna be, okay, look, I, goodness knows, there's a whole bunch of issues where I feel like the science has been clear on this. And I think you have to ask, okay, how could someone be coming up with an anti-science reason? And what, what is the worldview that is prioritizing that? And how can I still manage to see them as a full human being and a decent person in American? Because I think if you get there, the chance that you can have a dialogue is a lot better. Do I think you can change them? Very unlikely. As I like to say, I have never walked into my family dinner table and sat down and said, I'm smarter than you, I know more than you, shut up and let me tell you something. In my family it doesn't work, and I bet it doesn't work. With people who don't even know me, how could it work? I, I think it's really about making the connection more than changing the, the attitude up front. Thank you. Hello, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Eddie, I'm a sophomore here at CMC studying economics and international relations. So I am originally from Iowa. I'm not a hog farmer, but uh, I do know many farmers. Which town? Ames. Okay. Yeah. So, so did one of your prof were your parents work at Iowa State? No, but my dad got his postdoc at Iowa State. Okay. Um, so my question is kind of similar to the previous one. You mentioned at the very end of your uh, conversation how you wish you were a little bit more stern with people, and I was wondering how you can balance that um, when you're trying to talk to people like these farmers who are very passionate about their traditional ways of doing things and they don't want to give up, you know, their family history and things like that. So we'd love some insight so, on that. So let me start by saying that my uncle was a professor at the University of Iowa. Ames was considered right next to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a huge rivalry. I really distinguish between the people who I think do or should know everything and are in positions of power and normal people. Normal people, it's not their job. I would never get mad at person. I would never be rude. I would want to listen and hear. I'd do exactly what I was saying to Thomas I would do. Tell me what you think about. Let me understand why you're saying that. I don't agree, but I'd like to hear why you think that. And, and that's fine with me. And I, you know, honestly, it's very hard to change people's minds. But it, my only two rules are tell the truth and put America first. Those are my only two rules. If I see someone who I think is either not telling the truth or especially not telling the truth so as to put themselves ahead of everybody else in the United States, I, I think it's completely wrong. I, I can get mad really fast. And it's really for people who are in positions of power prioritizing themselves over the rest of us. I, I just stinks and I should have been way meaner about calling that out because that really stinks and that's really the thing that's holding us back. Thank you. Hello, I want to just first say thank you so much for this talk. It was like incredible. So my name is Mia Giordano. I'm currently a sophomore here at CMC and I'm studying public policy. And I want to preface my question before by saying like the first time I ever saw you, like heard your name was on a YouTube video saying the impeachment for Donald Trump. <laughs> so my question is, is, and is what will happen to this campaign of impeachment for Donald Trump with now that he is running again in 2020? And what are you going to do in your power to educate voters on why you believe that he is a threat to American democracy and politics today? So, so let me apologize up front because uh, I was saying I thought I wasn't mean enough, but for him I actually think I was mean enough. <laughs> And let me say why I did that, because it isn't because I disagreed with them on policy. I'm not lying, I really believe in America you have a right to your own opinion, and as long as you're telling the truth and trying to put, help the country, you can disagree on everything, and I'd love to have a beer with you afterwards. It's not a problem. Even stuff I really, really, really care about, because I know people see things differently, and that's a democracy. The reason that Trump got my goat so much was I thought he was trying to bring down democracy itself. I thought that he, was a, he would go after it. He would get worse every day, and he would eventually be trying to take out the system for his own advantage. So I thought he was both a liar, and he put himself a bit ahead of the rest of Americans. And he was, a li I don't feel this way about any other Republican. 
I felt like he was going to attack the system at its roots, and he did. You know, everyone else was like, January 6th, man, it's a violent attack on the Congress of the United States. And who knew he would do that? It's like, were you paying attention? That to me was absolutely preordained, and that wasn't the worst he'll be. This is not something where he's gonna go back to being a normal human being. It's only gonna get worse. I really do think that he's someone, it's not a fluke that he loves Vladimir Putin. It's not a fluke that he loved all the despots in the world, that he connected with them, that he wished that he could be like them. He wanted to be them. That is the end of our system. So I'm, you know, when you really see the real thing and it's dead wrong, it's also really fun to get in a fight, in my opinion. If you're sure you're right and that's absolutely wrong, then I think you should wade in with both fists. And that's exactly what I tried to do. Thank you. Tom, Tom, thank you so much. It's been a great presentation. We have to get you to the Ontario airport. You've got lots more good work. We wish you well. Yeah, um, you said it. Like, Thank you so much to Tom for coming today. Thank you for moderating the amazing discussion. And thank you all for coming and being out here with us tonight on this Tuesday night. Thank you guys very much for coming. It's a total pleasure to be here.